You don't get to win every time in a democracy. And when you lose, you got to man up and accept it. Hi there, it's WAMC News Director Ian Pickus. Happy Independence Day to you and yours. I hope you're having a safe and wonderful holiday weekend. Back to politics, the House is launching a new investigation of the January 6th Capitol siege. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi named six fellow Democrats to what will be a 13-member panel, which will also include ousted GOP Conference Chair Liz Cheney of Wyoming, who was stripped of her leadership position after refusing to countenance former President Donald Trump's falsehoods about the 2020 election. The vote to set up the special committee to investigate the riot at the Capitol came with officers injured in the siege looking on from the gallery. The party line tally to establish the committee and the committee itself were dismissed by GOP leader Kevin McCarthy as a partisan exercise. Democrats in the Northeast have been telling WAMC since that day that they still have unanswered questions about what happened on the winter morning when Trump backers broke into the Capitol as the election results were being locked in. In honor of this Independence Day during a most unusual time in American history, here's our oral history of the Capitol siege on January 6th, as told by people who were in and around the building, members of Congress. Well, I had started the day in my office in room 208, which is a Ways and Means office, and it's literally 10 feet from the floor of the House of Representatives, maybe 15 feet from the entrance to Statuary Hall. My wife and, and kids uh, came to D.C. Um, and uh, where we were all together. That morning I was in my apartment, uh, which is just a few blocks away uh, from the Capitol, and preparing um, to uh, make my way uh, uh, to the Capitol um, with my wife and kids. And uh, things materialized uh, very quickly. Well, we were, you know, engaged in the... Uh in the job the Constitution requires, counting the Electoral College votes, the Republicans were undertaking to object. The Senate had um, left to go back to its chamber, and debate had begun on the objections. And it was a sort of split-screen moment because I was watching on my phone out of one eye what was happening outside and uh, and as it developed. And then, of course, it was only a matter of moments before... Uh, the protesters were inside the Capitol. Since we didn't know anything, after they left, we went back to work. Uh, Senator Jim McGovern, representative from Massachusetts, took the chair, and we continued the process. Uh, but then a Capitol uh, police officer uh, spoke, and this never happens in, in, in my experience, and told us that there was information that uh, the mob had gotten into the Capitol and that we had, and was ga- there, was, there was gas mask under our seats, and we had to put those on, get those out, get them ready, and put them on. And then shortly after that, um, we heard a gunshot. It turns out that that was the shot where the woman attempting to uh, breach the uh, doors uh, that go into the house was shot. You could hear the uh, tear gas canisters being deployed. The Capitol Police made an announcement in the chamber that we should reach under our seats and pull out the, you know, the, the, the gas masks that are, you know, kept there for emergencies or chemical attack. Um, and at that point, the protesters reached the doors and began to break the windows out of the doors that were around the House chamber. The staff performed, uh, you know, really heroically, the Capitol Police uh, as well, dealing with a completely out of control situation. So the protesters had reached the doors, literally the doors of the chamber, which had been quickly closed and locked. And the staff had piled furniture up, um, which is honestly a sight I thought I'd never see. Uh, desks and, you know, uh, heavy, heavy lamps and anything they could find. It looked like a it looked like a, a movie scene, you know, with a barricade at the doors. And this prevented the protesters from gaining access to the House chamber temporarily. But, you know, the security people had their guns drawn. The glass was being broken out of the doors. And you could you could hear the uh, tear gas being deployed outside in the rotunda. So it was a completely um, unacceptable situation. I was conducting regular business, going through a lot of tax matters, talking about trade with staff, signing letters, writing documents, 
And at 1.30, I was in the midst of a phone call with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis. And we, we were talking uh, on a Zoom presentation about Brexit. And as you know, we pushed very hard for the Brexit negotiations to make sure there would be no reestablishment of the hard border between the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland. And that uh, did not happen. So I was in a pretty good mood uh, saying that uh, although I disagreed with Brexit as a strategy, I was pleased that there would be no border reestablished on the island. And the conversation was going swimmingly well. And all of a sudden, two of my staffers started to signal to me that uh, I needed to get off the call. So I just said, there's turmoil here, and uh, I'm delighted to talk to you. And then went to look out the window and noticed that they were literally at my windows and uh, yelling and screaming, pounding on the windows, which they subsequently broke. Capitol Police just announced that there was a breach. Uh, somebody or some people got into the building uh, past security, so they blocked the chamber in the House, and they've locked the chamber in the Senate. I was in the Senate chamber um, with uh, my colleagues. Uh, I don't think I ever, you know, feared for my life that day. Um, there were certainly really harrowing moments when, uh, you know, we could hear the protesters outside the Senate doors, and it wasn't quite clear what the plan was to keep us safe. Um, watching those security videos uh, at the impeachment trial um, was, you know, chilling to see how close we were to protesters that clearly had an intent to, you know, kill at least some of us if they found us. Um, but, yeah, we pretty quickly made it to, you know, a safe room, uh, a place where we felt secure, where we had a little bit bigger security presence. We were sitting there. The, the, the debate was going on on the certification process one state after another. And then a number of us looked up and saw a uh, very alarming sight, and it was the security people for Speaker Pelosi and for Leader Hoyer. They came rushing from the back of the room, and they had, I don't want to say panic-stricken, but extremely concerned looks on their faces. And they just grabbed Pelosi and uh, Hoyer. There was no questions asked, and they took them off the floor. The Capitol Police rushed into my office. They pulled a Republican fellow, a new one, I'm not sure of his name, uh, off the floor and ordered him into the office with us, I was with two staffers, I think three Capitol Police officers, and a Republican member. And the officer said, look, this table, which is massive, could seat up to 16 to 18 people. Uh, we need to barricade the door. We picked up the table, the six of us, pushed it toward the door. The doors were being pounded on. People were yelling about the Ways and Means Committee. Pushing. We were sandwiched between those pounding on the glass on the outside and those pounding on the door on the inside. I thought the door at one point was going to bow, and the Capitol Police, at the end of the table, he drew his gun. And we uh, turned off the lights, uh, went silent on our calls, and the deputy director of the uh, uh, House Security, she said, I'm going to have to ask all of you, to write your names and your addresses and the states you represent on this piece of paper in case this really goes awry. And she carefully folded it, put it in her pocket, and for 40 minutes they pushed and shoved at that door, but they couldn't get through. Uh, we were just told that there has been tear gas in the rotunda, and we're being instructed uh, to each of us get uh, gas masks that are under our seats. I think, you know, the first time that I learned that there were protesters outside, it was because of a, a text from a friend or a, a family member. And, and yes, of course, we were, you know, furiously trying to keep our, our closest family members apprised of, you know, where we were and, and the fact that we eventually made it to safety. Some of us were upstairs, some downstairs, and it was so that we could comply with social distancing. Normally, all of us would be on the floor. But uh, that's, that's where I was, and we were the last ones uh, to get out safely. After about 40 minutes radioing back and forth, uh, they came to the conclusion that it was okay for us to move out of 208. In the Capitol itself, there are these uh, cavernous staircases. So we were to avoid the elevators, move down. There was a Capitol a police officer that moved ahead of us to make sure that the crowd wouldn't be waiting at some interval that you couldn't see around the corner. 
and we made our way over to 1100, which is another ways and means room. It's where the hearings take place and the markups take place. And we sat there for four hours until Speaker Pelosi and Hakeem Jeffries and then uh, Liz Cheney. They uh, defiantly announced at about 7 o'clock that evening that we were going to resume our work, that the Capitol had been secured, and we were going on to uh, embrace our constitutional responsibility to confirm the election of Joe Biden. And that was literally right below us. We were on the third floor. That shot occurred on the second floor, uh, right below where we were. Now, at that time, we didn't know that that's what it was. It sure sounded like a shot, but we just had no information. Uh, And then the police were really concerned. They had their guns out. They were monitoring all the doors. Somebody tried to breach one of the doors, and one of the police officers pushed the person back, closed the door, and they got all the doors locked. But the journey for us up there is hard uh, because the, 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 the aisles are very, very narrow, and we had to go all the way around uh, this rectangular structure up there, uh, most of the time getting on the ground uh, to, just to, in response to the orders from the Capitol Police, uh, obviously, who were fearing uh, that folks would make it in and feared that they were armed. So uh, thank goodness we all got out uh, safely, but everyone was uh, – concerned for 10 minutes we were in the chamber we knew that there were individuals outside um the uh staff was hurriedly trying to lock the doors but of course at that point we knew that they had somehow breached the outside doors of the capitol so what would stop them from breaching the doors of the of the senate and so it certainly did occur to me you know as to you know the the prospect of potentially being in some kind of hand-to-hand combat with protesters if they you know entered the entered the the, the building There were levels of fear. The first level was for my colleagues who I knew were there and on the floor. Um, the second was uh, in the evening um, when I had to make my way to the Capitol. Um, the air uh, was tense and certainly felt um, unsafe um, and had to take precautions to make sure that I can get to the Capitol safely. Uh, and then even in the Capitol, once you're in there, and having just witnessed what had transpired, um, you know, the air in the in, in the building um, was tense. Uh, you know, so from my vantage point, uh, there was no doubt um, a, a a a moment, a quality about this whole experience that felt very unfamiliar in terms of uh, as a member of Congress, as 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 somebody who uh, believes in our democracy and the peaceful transition of power, uh, to know that it, that that. Uh, that level of violence or any level could come that close uh, to the seat of a government in America. Uh, the standard bearer of democracy is, um, is one that we have to really step back and, and reflect upon as a country uh, and simply do the work of understanding um, uh, what must be done to make sure that we do all we can to protect our democracy uh, and do right by each other in the process. January 5th, was our elections in Georgia. And I knew that if our two senators in Georgia won, I would have achieved my lifelong dream of becoming the majority leader. Um, So I'm nervous. I stay up all night looking at the results. Tuesday night bleeds into Wednesday morning. I'm still on the computer. What's the results in Chatham County? What's the African-American turnout in DeKalb County at 2 a.m.? Finally, at 4 a.m., they declare it's clear that our two candidates have won. My first reaction, joy. When you've achieved a goal um, that you've long sought after, detours in the road, logs in the path, of course, joy and, to me, gratefulness to God that that has happened. But I had a second reaction immediately thereafter, which I've tried to describe as, I couldn't figure out the right word immediately, but I call it awe. I don't mean awe in the sense my teenage daughters used to use it. She said the movie was awesome, but awe in the biblical sense. When the angels see the face of God, they tremble in awe. And I realized the huge responsibilities on my shoulders and the shoulders of our thin majority um, to get things done, the kinds of things I've mentioned before. So I have those two emotions coursing through my veins. I can't sleep. I get up at 7. I'm in Brooklyn. Drive down to Washington. Get on the floor of the Senate at 1 p.m. That first time is the putative majority leader. 
I'm on the floor of the Senate for just just about an hour when a police officer in a bulletproof vest and a submachine gun strapped across his waist grabs me by the collar. I'll never forget the firmness of that grab. And he says, Senator, you're in danger. we got to move. I didn't know what the danger was. He explained it to me. And you may have seen this because this was on the video cameras, um, the security cameras. They caught it overhead, used it in the impeachment trial. We go out the Senate chamber. We turn to the right. I'm walking briskly with a police officer on either side of me. We go through a door, and then you don't see us on this film for about 20 seconds. And then we're coming out the door, running at full speed the other way. I was at the, within 20 feet of these insurrectionist, horrible, horrible people. And one of them had a gun, had a couple of them uh, uh, blocked a door. Who knows what would have happened? It was reported later. One of them said, there's the big Jew. Let's get him. So that was the worst of times. In the days ahead, our duty will require us to push for accountability for every rioter who desecrated the Capitol, for the president who incited them, every option available from evoking the 25th Amendment to impeachment and removal to criminal prosecution should all be on the table. It was sedition, plain and simple. There has been a direct line drawn from his campaign to this moment. We must assess and redress the role of ultra-conservative media that purports to be news, but only offers misinformation and division, and the role and power of unchecked social media to divide our nation. The experience was just so universal in terms of what everybody, uh, we were all witnesses, you know, we were all, I won't, I won't use the word t- victims, but we were certainly all witnesses to, to what was going on there. And, um, you know, talking to some of the Capitol police officers in the aftermath, you know, the 140 physical injuries, which had been, you know, repeated. And I didn't even know that, frankly, until about a week or so ago that the number had climbed to that level. But there's no question that the that the um, trauma, you know, the invisible wounds um, are going to, you know, be part of these folks' lives. And and I spoke to one personally who was not physically injured, but he was out there for hours, you know, fighting these you know, animals that were trying to, um, you know, get past him and and hurt him. And he he uh, he he had been out of work from the 6th until uh, they did the Brian Sitnik viewing in the Capitol Rotunda. That's mm-hmm. the officer who did lose his life. So he was he was out for a couple of weeks, and he um, you could tell he was, he was still, um, you know, very um, shook shook up. And by the way, the guy, you know, he's a big guy. I mean, I'm looking up to him while I'm talking to him. And, uh, you know, I'm five foot nine, so I'm relatively short. But, um, you know, he's not somebody who I think has – you know, he's physically a strong person, and um, but what, what he had to put up with was just, again, it's going to haunt him and his colleagues for many years to come. I felt very strongly that uh, the people who attacked us should could not win. This was an insurrection. They tried to subvert to all the American people. Look, I was the last. I was one of the last people off the House floor. I was chairing a, a session uh, when right. they attacked. I had no idea that they had breached the Capitol. Uh, in the manner that they did. It wasn't until I walked off the floor and I was in the uh, speaker's lobby that has glass doors that I actually came face to face with this mob. There were three Capitol Police officers uh, standing between them and a in this glass door, and they were banging and breaking the glass in the door. And I looked at them in disbelief and, in, and with anger and sadness, to be honest with you. Um, and I said to the person next to me, you know, these people aren't here to make a political point. They're not here to hand us a pamphlet. They're here to kill us, um, and they're here to desecrate and destroy this uh, this sacred building. Uh, and um, and so I I'll never forget that as long as I live. I mean, I if you ask me to describe what evil looks like, I will tell you it was looking into the eyes of these people who were you know banging and 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 and, and destroying. Uh, the Capitol property, who, who broke the glass. I mean, I just, I, I, once I left, as soon as I left that uh, that room to start walking out of the seas, that's when the, the woman was shot. I mean, it was, a, you know, a terrible, terrible day. And, uh, and I'm going to just say this finally, and that is um, I'll never forgive Donald Trump uh, for instigating this, and I'm having a tough time dealing with some of my colleagues who gave oxygen uh, to this big lie that resulted in this attack. And I'm 
still a little bit, well, more than a little bit, still very angry at those who, even after the attack, came back and voted to nullify and overturn the legitimate results uh, of the presidential election. It's just hard for me to, to put my head around that. Um, and uh, so uh, some feelings are, are still a little bit raw around here. You don't get to win every time in a democracy. And when you lose, you got to man up and accept it and, and go back and win the next time and make your arguments within the Constitution and the law. And, and none of us should have to say that. We need more adults right now in the United States of America who, who set a better example for, for the kids who are watching this uh, unfold. And, and I've got to tell you, I never thought that I'd be standing on the floor of the House watching staff uh, in a, in a panic-stricken way pile up desks and furniture to keep an angry mob from storming the people's house. Um, and and, and it, it just should never, it should never get to this point. And it's, it's a, incumbent on all of us to lower the temperature, to measure our words, and to, and to get, conduct ourselves like responsible adults who serve the Constitution and the law. It was an assault on our democracy, a terrifying assault on our democracy. Um, and people need to be held to account. All right, that does it for this episode of the WAMC News Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Stay safe and have a great rest of your holiday. Until next time, I'm Ian Pickus.